very good afternoon to all our Fukum listeners out there. I'm Dr. William Chung, the Managing Director of Fukum, sorry, Managing Editor of Fukum uh, at the Yusof Fishak uh, Institute. Uh, Fukum is a commentary and analysis website for the Institute. Today I have uh, two very distinguished guests with me, uh, Ambassador Katerina Zelenko and Professor C. Raja Mohan. And we are here to talk about the invasion of Ukraine one year on and the implications for Southeast Asia. Just a quick introduction to our two speakers. Uh, ambassador Zelenko is uh, Ukraine's ambassador to Singapore. She comes to Singapore with more than 20 years of foreign policy experience with the Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And she has seen postings in Vienna, in, in Berlin. Um, and more recently, she was a spokesperson for the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry, which I think would be a fairly stressful uh, position. And she was a uh, Deputy Director of Communications and Public Diplomacy at the MFA. Dr. Mohan uh, needs no introduction to listeners at Fukram and in Southeast Asia. Professor Mohan wears many hats, including the Senior Fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute in New Delhi. He's a contributing editor on international affairs at the Indian Express, and he's also a visiting professor at the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. And should I note, uh, I've just found out, Raja, that you have a master's in nuclear physics. Yeah. So master's in nuclear physics and a PhD in international relations, something that uh, not many people would have uh, claimed to. So very good afternoon again to you, to our guests. Thank you. Yeah. And, and Raja, and we'll, we'll go straight in, into the podcast. Um, now, we've seen, uh, uh, we are fast approaching the first year of the invasion of Ukraine uh, by Russia. And uh, we've seen a lot of drama with uh, Ukrainian uh, armed forces putting a, up a very spirited fight and changing the complexion of the war. But what was seen was a quick invasion by Russia is actually turning out to be a long drawn kind of war of attrition that's now focused on the West. Uh, so my question to both our speakers is, how do you see things uh, panning out in, in, in the second year, going into the second year of the war? Perhaps we can have uh, Ambassador Zelenko first and then Professor Mohan. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for having me on this podcast. Uh, in fact, um, we're approaching the first year since Russia started its unjustified and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. Um, I would be conscious with the term war of attrition, because, you know, it's, if we look at this year, we could clearly see that um, it took Ukrainian defenders four counteroffensive operations to get back half of the territory seized by Russia since the start of the invasion. Uh, instead, it uh, was quite a challenge for the Russian army, and it has uh, been struggling uh, seven months to take one town of 70,000 people, mm -hmm. which means that uh, um, the regime in Kremlin had underestimated its possibilities the allegedly second uh, largest army in the world appeared to be poorly led and uh, uh, disoriented. Um, and I think we could quite break the nose. Now we need to break the back. And so this is um, quite a challenge if we take into account that we are dealing with authoritarian leader ready to throw as much cannon fodder as is needed to make a difference. We are dealing with a country that is not prepared to accept uh, any failure as it could pose a, even a threat to the future of Putin's regime as such. And um, of course, it is a country that is uh, all time blackmailing the world with nuclear weapons, which um, means that there is still a long way to go. As for Ukraine, it's important not only to um, withstand and to sustain its resilience, it's also important to liberate our territories. Uh, so, um, that means we need support. We enjoy excellent support from our partners. Thanks to the uh, weapons, financial support provided to Ukraine, we still keep holding our ground. Um, in a way, we will need more in order to make a difference and to achieve any counteroffensive. You all know that to be 
growing is a counteroffensive operation is a much bigger challenge as it requires a lot of resource, manpower, and equipment. Mm -hmm. So we will see, and there is actually a full complex of uh, um, uh, elements that we need to consider to speak about the second year of the war. Um, no one except Russia is interested in a protracted war. Russia plays on time. Ukraine and its partners are not interested in the protracted conflict as it takes human lives, it takes a lot of resource. Um, that means that the more support Ukraine is getting in its future, the sooner we will be able to bring peace and sustainable security situation to Europe. Thanks a lot, Ambassador. I, I, I like your face about breaking the nose and then breaking the back and not wanting a protracted war. Uh, Raja, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I think uh, my, my sense is we are now at a decisive phase uh, in the war. And uh, I would, I would uh, from looking at all the news reports that are coming in from the front, uh, both sides are preparing for fresh offensives. Uh, but what we've seen of the Russian performance so far uh, the Russians have resorted to the traditional tactic of just throwing mass. Uh, this has always been the Russian way of war, just deploying, you know, human beings. And as we noted in the last year, I mean, without even uh, fully trained uh, and uh, without really uh, great equipment. Uh, so what we've seen is really a pretty uh, poor performance of the Russian armed forces. Uh, and uh, But Russians are going to escalate because I think uh, he doesn't have a choice, it looks like. Uh, he's going to throw more and more people into the war. And uh, the Ukraine uh, is now going to get better weapons. Uh, and my sense is, as the, we have the spring thaw, uh, there will be fresh offensives by both sides. And going on the previous performance, uh, I, would, I would say uh, Ukraine uh, should be in a better position. I mean, I think uh, in one area, uh, maneuver warfare, where the Ukrainians have shown the capacity to maneuver, but the Russians haven't. Uh, so it remains to be seen uh, if Russia makes a big move, uh, whether the Ukrainians are going to move on the flank and whether they can cut off the Russian uh, defensive lines into two. Uh, that, I think, would be the big military thing to watch out for. But I think uh, things will certainly get worse uh, before they get any better, I think. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that, Raja. And I think the one, one commendation of credit to Ukrainian armed forces is the way in they have quickly assimilated and acclimatized to the new weapon systems that have been given to them by the United States and the West. So, like you said, it, it, it might prove to be decisive, uh, especially with the kind of leopard tanks and the long-range artillery systems that they're getting. So, uh, we will all uh, watch with much eagerness going to uh, the second year. Um, the, the other question I have for, for our guests is uh, something closer to home. So, uh, the ambassador was telling us earlier about how her cousins and her mom and her relatives in Ukraine had been affected. And uh, my question is, is and this has kind of an import for Singaporeans as well as Southeast Asians, um, is we've seen heartening stories about ordinary Ukrainians, uh, computer programmers, carpenters, moms, other kinds of civilians taking up arms and fighting for their country, which we think, you know, it's an obvious thing to do, but the way that they've done it, you know, with, with the spiritedness and the determination has really impressed many uh, in, in this part of the world. So um, my question for, for the ambassador is, is there something that Singaporeans and other Southeast Asians can learn from, uh, from, from what your, your fellow countrymen are doing uh, in putting out the fight? Well, I think uh, firstly and foremostly it is the fact that safety and security may not be taken for granted. That's something that we in Ukraine are experiencing up close. We just now realized how much is at stake for our country. We always say if Russia stops fighting, there will be no war. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no Ukraine. So it's all about the existence of a nation that has been attacked by a neighboring country. Uh, and uh, we all see that this imperialism, neo-imperialism, which is actually something that goes and runs as a red thread through the whole history of uh, Russia, this is something that is always easy to sell for the inner audience. And that is exactly what Russia uses, especially if it comes to territorial expansion, uh, to um, use it as a cornerstone of the Russian propaganda. So in Ukraine, we were prepared 
for that already after uh, more than eight years of the war that actually started in 2014 when Russia occupied Crimea and instigated the war in Ukraine and Donbass. Yeah, but speaking about um, the lessons that have to be learned by um, other nations, also here in Singapore, I think we need to be grateful for the strong position of Singapore that was taken in the very first days of this invasion. It was uh, a strong statement against invasion, sanctions that were imposed that now help uh, to join the big group of countries willing to um, deprive Russia of the revenues, to deprive it of the elements needed to sustain this terrible military machine. That's what is needed. Um, speaking, going back to the uh, lessons learned, I think we also need to keep in mind that we live in the age of IT, of hybrid warfare, and before you read and uh, perceive any facts, you better double check them, because this is one of the instruments Russia has been gaining muscles with over the last, I would say, 20 years, and you see what kind of um, resulting success Putin has with it uh, within his own society. So for, our, for all of us across the globe, it is really important to stay vigilant and to realize that what is happening in Ukraine is not a distant war. Uh, it is um, uh, something that is quite a challenge to our common humanity too. And uh, that means that we need to to join our efforts today and now in order to make a difference to show to the world that any change of borders by force cannot be tolerated. Otherwise, we will open the Pandora box. Thanks for that. And, and incidentally, uh, Ambassador, it just occurred to me that the 15th of February today is Total Defense Day in Singapore, commemorating the fall of Singapore to the Japanese Imperial Army on uh, 1942, uh, uh, 71 uh, years ago. So it's especially pertinent that you're talking about ordinary citizens uh, putting up the fight uh, when the, the safety and security of their country is compromised. Uh, Raja, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would say the, the region, I think, uh, has not uh, focused on the core principles uh, that are at stake in this war. I think Singapore has been an honorable exception uh, all across Asia, I would say much of Asia, uh, I'll come back to Japan, uh, uh, that that this is unacceptable. I mean, I, I think that's a fundamental principle there. Uh, it is surprising because Asia, we are so sensitive about territorial sovereignty, uh, non-intervention in the internal affairs of uh, uh, countries. Uh, but Russia, what Russia has done in Ukraine, I mean, is to unilaterally uh, seek, use force uh, to change borders. It did it in 2014. I mean, most of the West too kept quiet at the time. But for, for Asia, I mean, that if we accept the prin principle that you can march into another country, seize territory, conduct a referendum there, and say, this is mine. And I think the implications of this uh, for Asia, where the massive number of territorial disputes uh, is, really, is really huge. And, and I think... Uh, we've not really paid attention. And I think uh, you, Japan, Japanese Prime Minister Kishida, has repeatedly said, if you let the unilateral uh, uh, use of force to change borders in Ukraine stand, uh, something similar uh, will happen in Asia. Uh, and I think it will encourage many countries, those who are in a position, who are more powerful than their neighbors, uh, to use force. Uh, so I think whether it will happen or not tomorrow or day after, but I think this is a core principle of international affairs. It's a core principle of our territorial sovereignty that we need to come out and make this principle, underline this principle, of whatever our interests are in, uh, in, in Russia, uh, with Russia. Second, I think, uh, is, the, is the fact that the brutality of this war, uh, it was Russia, actually, that convened the first Hague Convention uh, in 1899. It was Saar Nicholas the second who called for a you know on you know how to resolve disputes, uh, how to conduct war, uh, that became a part of a series of international humanitarian law. That was the first conference. But yet today, Russia, what Russia is doing, uh, destroying civilian uh, in apartment buildings, uh, destroying electricity uh, uh, 
power stations, uh, water supply stations. Uh, this is even at the worst time. India and Pakistan didn't do it to each other. Uh, many Asians, we've not done this to each other, where we have fought wars between each other. But I think this is absolutely unacceptable behavior because I think uh, if this uh, becomes a model for others, uh, this is just uh, going to be terrible for us. I mean, I'll also say part of the problem in, 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 in our regions has been uh, we continue to see Russia as a legacy of the Soviet Union, uh, that we have no sensibility to Russia's imperial past. So I think we've historically, as nations emerged in Asia, we framed Russia uh, in opposition to Soviet Russia, in opposition to the Western imperial powers who were ruling Asia. So our historic memory is one of the Soviet Union standing up for colonial liberation. But Russia has a history of imperialism. And none of them, no, nobody has been more, uh, no, nobody has suffered more than the Eastern Central European states. They know it very well. So I think we've not paid enough attention to why countries of Central Europe, why countries of which border Russia on the West want to join NATO, uh, want to uh, get some security, because we frame it as US versus Russia, of uh, forgetting the, the considerations, the concerns, of the Central European states. And I, I think we need to do that a lot more, that why countries want to join NATO, not merely saying, oh, it's all America's fault, uh, because the countries bordering Russia are afraid of Russia, and Russia has done nothing uh, to, to reduce those fears. And now its aggression is only going to make it worse. Thanks, Raja. I mean, there's, there's a great exposition about, you know, how it's unacceptable to principles of international law. It's, of course, the Russian brutality in bombing civilian facilities and and, and kind of uh, buildings. Um, but I, I, I want to thank you, actually, for helping me bring this discussion forward even before I've asked the question. But so the question being, uh, Raja, if, if it's so... so uh, brutal and it's so unacceptable for Russia to have done what it has done in Ukraine. Why, why, you know, do you think that Southeast Asian countries or Asian countries have such varied responses to the invasion of Ukraine? Is it simply because it's so far away or because they, they don't get the full import of the, the importance of what is happening in, in Ukraine? Uh, because obviously we all know that apart from countries like Singapore and Australia and Japan, and Japan, and Japan. Uh, most other Asian countries, uh, including China, uh, including Myanmar, Vietnam, Laos, they, they've not expressed condemnation of, of the invasion. No, I would say three, three factors. I mean, uh, I would say you're right in saying people see this as a distant war, uh, despite the fact that uh, all of us uh, face the consequences uh, of uh, the war. Uh, whether it's in food security, fertilizers, uh, energy, uh, whole of the world economy uh, has been affected uh, because the region in play, Russia is a major exporter of uh, hydrocarbons. Ukraine is a major exporter of uh, food grains. So in a way, it's a very, very critical region. But yet we see this as a, as a war that is distant. Second, I think, uh, is the is the sense that uh, uh, the the belief in the in the you know i think many of us have unconsciously bought into the propaganda that this is all about nato expansion and not see the historic tensions have always existed in central europe uh, it's for a reason why the poles don't like russians uh, swedes are afraid of russians and the tension between in in you know in the countries in the center of europe uh, germany on one side russia on the other side the borders kept changing so I think Central Europe has, has not had a lasting settlement over the last 300 years. I mean, the two world wars are part of that. And the much of the Cold War was concentrated there in Europe. Uh, and we thought we had transcended that uh, by what happened in 1991, but clearly we've not. So I think the region where the struggle is going on, it's really about uh, how does Russia live with uh, peacefully with its neighbors in Europe? Uh, this question is an old one. Uh, and I think that question has not been answered. And, and I think, uh, and we've not had enough appreciation of the Central European problems. It's easy to frame it as a US-Russian thing or a major power war, rather than seeing it as a fundamental question of European security, which has implications for everyone. Uh, how do you construct a stable structure of peace at the, at the center of Europe? 
whether it's the Congress of Vienna, the Treaty of Versailles, or the post yalta And now, uh, all these are about the central question. And I think we've long stopped paying attention to European history. And I think we need to do a, a lot more, a lot more of that. A third reason I would say is Russia has had friends. Uh, India, for example, Vietnam, uh, Laos, Indochina, uh, many countries buy weapons from Russia. So I think uh, the that we should not offend your friends uh, or you don't want to risk the consequences given the dependencies. In Indian case, okay. uh, India depends so much on Russian weapons. So, so we have a problem. Uh, and, and while India is now increasingly moving closer to the West and trying to reduce the dependence on Russia uh, on the weapon side, but the near term dependence on Russia, especially when India is caught in a war with China, uh, is very high. So, so I think I don't think, at least in the Indian case I can speak for, I don't think people are happy with this. Uh, that, But the fact that India has to be silent uh, is, it, is unfortunate. Uh, but but I think it reflects the conditions under which uh, India is in. Mm. Thank, thank you very much for that. Yeah, um, I think maybe uh, just in addition to that, I think you're making a very good point, Professor. And um, for us in Ukraine, it's of course important to see the clear stance of countries a clear understanding of what's really happening in Ukraine and what could be the uh, potential threat of it for the global security architecture. And of course, we all realize that under these circumstances, neutrality is something that only plays in the hands of the aggressor country. Um, besides, um, Russia has gotten away for decades with such kind of uh, aggression towards its neighbors. Um, after Georgia, after occupation of Crimea in 2014. I still remember how the media in Ukraine uh, published articles with the headlines, Ukraine is next uh, when Russia invaded Georgia and no one could believe it. Uh, and then it happened. So that means that really we need to see that the world is extremely globalized nowadays. The threat to one imperils the security of all. Uh, the UN Charter has been massively compromised. And that is our aim to protect it now, because if we don't, then it could come to a complete upheaval on the geopolitical map of the world. And uh, especially for the smaller countries, it could also be uh, quite a challenge in the future. That's why it's so important to let Ukraine win, not because we are a nation of warmongers, but because we all realize that what is happening now is the largest international armed conflict due to its magnitude since the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And if we do not stop it now, and if we do not uh, make Ukraine and Russia lose and be punished in the ICJ, you know, that the process has been launched already there and 31 countries already intervened, intervened in this process of collecting evidence of Russian crimes against um, humanity, war crimes. So we, in fact, are dealing with genocidal war. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you very much, Ambassador. So. Um, this, this is a point that Raja has raised uh, about uh, you know, Russia having friends uh, in, in the region, in Asia, Southeast Asia. So my question for you is in, in terms of the brass tax. I mean, we, we see that uh, at the ASEAN summit uh, in November last year, the Ukrainian foreign minister, Kuliva, he actually urged ASEAN countries to condemn Russia's invasion. He said that ASEAN had signed the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation with Ukraine, and that's a sign of support for Kiev. But yet he said that there are other ways to support Ukraine, quote unquote. We, and, and as we have discussed, we know that there have been varied responses in Asia and in Southeast Asia to the invasion. And Singapore has been really against the invasion, has imposed sanctions. Uh, uh, other countries like Myanmar has been on the other side of the spectrum, uh, which they have actually implicitly supported the invasion. How, what additional things do you do think that ASEAN countries can actually do uh, to support Ukraine in, in your minister's words? Well, there are many ways to support Ukraine on the government level. You can always speak about uh, the decisions of uh, governments to provide humanitarian assistance as we're speaking about the huge plight of the people on the ground. Uh, Singapore, by the way, has provided uh, two packages of um, humanitarian assistance from the government. We could also have an opportunity to raise funds through Singapore Red Cross to support many hospitals in Ukraine and to 
accomplished many important projects that now help uh, people on the ground to mitigate their plight and to give them hope that there are so better days ahead of them. I think um, uh, a good way of doing, um, of contributing to um, Ukraine's um, resilience is to isolate Russia in the international forum. Uh, we know that Russia has been already expelled from um, 24 international organizations and uh, different fora. Um, uh, its uh, representatives could not be elected from the positions of chairs and vice chairs of more than 44 international bodies, uh, let alone the international sport and cultural competitions. Uh, but uh, we still, uh, there's still a long road ahead of us, as we now see, for example, the um, announcement made by the International Olympic Committee that is uh, ready to accept Russia's uh, athletes at the Olympic Games 2024. Um, and as a circumstances, sport as arts cannot be out of politics. Uh, that's the reality we need to face. And um, um, what are other ways to uh, support Ukraine politically? Uh, you'll remember the president of Ukraine presented the so-called peace formula during the G20 summit uh, end of last year. And this is um, the concept that consists of 10 pillars, 10 thematic elements that can provide a good way to achieve uh, a robust and sustainable peace in Ukraine. Um, the peace formula includes such elements as uh, nuclear safety, as uh, um, uh, prevention of ecocide, as we are now dealing with huge challenges in this regard, like pollution of water and burning forests and, and many other things. Um, as um, food security, um, uh, human rights, and so on. So there is always something for any nation that could be interested in joining the peace formula to be part of it on the individual level or collectively and that could be for example one of the options we invite many countries uh, and those like-minded nations to uh, join us in making it a reality and of course on the personal level it's always something that you can do for ukraine uh, you can uh, buy a ukrainian merch and wear it you can put a sticker on your computer you can talk to your friends and just uh, to write a letter to the editor uh, and to see what you as a person can do to support Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot for that. Writing a letter is, uh, is one of many things that Singaporeans and Asians will be good at doing. Uh, Raja, any, any ideas of uh, what Southeast Asians can do? Um, you know, my sense is uh, what you need, I think, uh, we tended to treat Europe as, you know, as irrelevant to Asian security generally, because except that our EU friends is to come and say, look, just emulate us, uh, you know, just follow the EU rules. And, uh, you know, so that's been, you know, whole, whole of Singapore is quite familiar with that. But I think we not really, we assume Europe has transcended geopolitics. Europe is no longer has conflicts within it was only a matter of integration the the technical details of economic integration and i think we are in a new phase uh, and i think uh, firstly i think as i said we need to devote a whole of asia uh, uh, we need to pay a lot more attention to europe european history second one of the consequences of this war has been uh, the integration of the european and asian theaters uh, that at the first summit of Madrid, uh, NATO summit last year in Madrid, uh, we had actually four uh, Asian uh, prime ministers, presidents uh, speak there. Uh, this was the first time ever Asian leaders were present at a NATO summit. Uh, we had uh, the Japanese prime minister, Kishida, uh, Korean president, Yoon, uh, the Australian prime minister, Albanese, and the New Zealand prime minister, uh, also there. So, so four of them addressed that meeting. So, so my sense is we should, we can no longer see Europe as a, as another theater uh, and that uh, Europe and uh, Asian theaters are going to be integrated. Therefore, we need to engage with, and all of the Europeans, uh, many of the European states, including EU, uh, France, of course, uh, Germany, Netherlands have all come out with strategies of uh, Indo-Pacific. So I think there will be, despite the war in Ukraine, uh, my sense is 
uh, thanks to what the Chinese and the Russians did just before the war uh, of unveiled alliance uh, before the, three weeks before the invasion, uh, that we're going to see more integration, one between Russia and China, and the other between uh, the rest of Europe and rest of Asia. This was something uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe of late Prime Minister uh, Abe of uh, Japan had sought. And my sense is we're going to have a lot more dynamic interaction between Europe and the Asian theaters. So it's in our own interest uh, to devote more attention, uh, to be able to engage uh, Europe and European security issues. While ASEAN uh, has not done much, I mean, I would say strongly uh, suggest to our viewers, look at what Korea has done. I mean, uh, South Korea is selling arms to Poland nearly $16 billion of worth of arms that Korea uh, is going to supply to if, if all the deals uh, come through. That is a broad commitment. So, so you have actually, we're already part of that war. You can say we're not there directly. Uh, it's something distant, but my sense is uh, our involvement, Asian involvement in European wars is growing. And I think uh, over the longer term, uh, I think Asia will eventually uh, contribute to European security. And we should also be prepared for larger European role uh, in Asia uh, to deal with the new dynamic uh, situation. And I think um, as a consequence of this war, the Americans are saying they want the European and Asian allies to come together, do a lot more together, uh, reinforce each other, help each other. So this is a very new, uh, new phenomenon. And my sense is uh, uh, all of us in the region will need to pay a lot more attention to this. Thanks, Raja. I think it's like uh, it's, it's been said that Russia has done for Europe and NATO what um, the US and NATO has not been able to do for decades, right? I mean, for, for, for decades, US presidents have gone to NATO and said that we need to uh, spend more on defense, you know, 2% of GDP. And, and I think the Russians did NATO the biggest favor in, in decades, and I think we can say the same thing um, for Southeast Asia and Asia. I think we really need to be more sensitive to the connections between uh, Europe and Asia because we, you know, as you mentioned, um, China and Russia having that strategic partnership, uh, what has happened in Ukraine could well happen uh, in Asia in terms of the Chinese copying the Russian playbook in terms of information warfare, hybrid warfare, uh, you know, gray zone activities. Um, and we, we've seen, you know, uh, Raja, you've written about it, hot spots in, in the region, like, you know, in Taiwan and South China Sea and the Korean Peninsula. So that's that's a great exposition. And I, I'm afraid that we we will take an entirely new podcast to to talk about that, that topic. But um, another question I have for you, uh, Raja, is... Uh, Looking at Asia's two big powers, you know, uh, China and India, they fall into the category of not condemning the, the invasion in Ukraine. And first, let's let's approach China. China has a very nuanced position, uh, to say the least, on 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 it has an alignment with Russia, but at the same time, we we all know that the Chinese are great at saying about you know, uh, calling on the West and Americans to respect. Uh, territorial integrity and sovereignty when these are principles that were blatantly violated in, in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So how, how do you see the Chinese panning out uh, in, in, you know, in terms of their policies going to the second year? I, I would say well, there's a major difference between the Russian and the Chinese position. And both of us have not uh, formally criticized Russia, but the difference is this. Uh, Russia has actively supported the... Rus so China has actively supported the Russian propaganda on uh, on NATO expansion, uh, essentially uh, claiming that Europe is responsible for this war. Uh, you see the, you know, China, which invested so much of diplomatic energy in Europe, and there's a huge economic relationship with Europe. If you see the February 4th statement of Putin and Xi Jinping, where it actually, for the first time, you have the Chinese joining Russia in blaming Europe. Uh, until then, I mean, Chinese had their own approach to Europe. They never bothered to support uh, the, the, the Russian positions on Europe. Uh, so the Russian Chinese position has changed. And, and I see uh, they haven't really fundamentally modified that position. So if you look at the Russian Chinese propaganda in the last one year, it continues to hop on. It's all, it is all the United States and NATO uh, who are responsible for this, uh, for this war. Uh, India is not doing that. India is not uh, blaming the West for this. India has a problem. 
It has to manage the historic association with Russia, and especially in the military domain. So I think there is a there is a big a big difference between the two sides. For the Chinese, I think I think it's again we go back to February fourth. Uh, that for the first time the two sides unveiled that look they have shared interest in opposing the West. Both of them, I suspect, uh, bought into their own propaganda about Russia, the West being in decline, a terminal decline. That therefore, that the moment has come to confront the West. Because if you look at the February 4th statement, uh, it talks about a lot of things about political values and, uh, you know, we are different and, you know, East versus the West. So many of the traditional tropes, I mean, they're all uh, confronting the West, not just in terms of what was happening in Ukraine, but framing that Russia and China have a very different set of values and interests vis-a-vis uh, vis-a-vis uh, vis the West. So, so I think they have had a shared interest, uh, and I haven't seen. I mean, while Russia, China, many people had hoped that as Russian effort failed in Ukraine, uh, they would actually modify their position, or at least help the West to mediate or resolve the problem. They have done nothing of sorts. Uh, so my my reading is Chinese are uh, nuanced, yes, but they're also deeply uh, cynically realist, uh, and I think Chinese perhaps believe that uh, that whatever happens in Ukraine, uh, they have more to gain. Uh, that is, for example, if Russia loses this war, I mean, then Russia will become even more dependent on China. It will become a junior partner. It's already on its way because it really uh, depends so much on China today uh, that it could become even worse. That it becomes a a, a really uh, a, a backwater for, uh, for for China to exploit its natural resources, uh, its hydrocarbons, uh, and uh, generally keep its northern frontier safe and secure. So, but a China that a, a Russia that wins uh, would also be a great victory for the Chinese because it's a victory against the West. Uh, it'll embolden uh, my sense uh, the Chinese to do more things in Asia. So therefore, I think the Chinese see themselves uh, sitting in a good position. And that they might calculate, look, things could turn. Russia, after all, has massive, uh, you know, resources, uh, that the war is not over, that it could still come to even a draw, uh, shall we say, even if it says that the West is forced to accept, look, territory for peace kind of a settlement, uh, the Chinese will say, look, I think it gives them a lot of advantages. Uh, so I think Russians, sorry, Chinese feel, uh, they're in a reasonably good position. And that's the reason why I suspect they've not uh, changed their position. And of course, uh, if the day uh, the reconstruction of Ukraine begins, the Chinese will be the first one in the queue uh, as well to, to rebuild uh, Ukraine. Thank you for that, Roger. That's an excellent point about the Chinese being at the winning side, whether Russia wins or loses in the, in the war. Uh, perhaps you want to now come to your, your country, uh, Raja. Um, was mentioned uh, the ICC uh, Yusuf Hishak released our State of Southeast Asia Survey 2023 uh, just last week. And uh, India actually scored very high in, in the ratings around the uh, thousand or so respondents in terms of trust ratings, and as well as India being a preferred strategic partner of ASEAN. Um, how do you see that? I mean, uh, we, we, we again, we, we do know that India has expressed kind of a equivocal uh, position on the invasion and uh, not really spoken out uh, on the invasion. But on the other hand, you, you see these good ratings coming from Southeast Asians of India. How, how do you interpret that, uh, Raja? Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm surprised too. In fact, uh, maybe we can have a separate podcast on that uh, because you you know more about how this uh, poll was done and what, what it does. Because last few years have not been good yeah. uh, for India-Southeast Asia relations. India did not sign the RCEP agreement there was a lot of disappointment, I would say, in uh, in uh, across the region, uh, and then uh, India has also uh, uh, been uh, somewhat, you know, India's you know position with the Quad and the Indo-Pacific seemed uh, opposed to the ASEAN uh, ASEAN positions uh, on uh, on you know, ASEAN centrality, etc. And then Singapore, countries like Singapore have had their own grievances where. Uh, the Amaravati or a whole range of areas where India had let down uh, some of its partners. So why has uh, the perception changed? I mean, I can only guess uh, uh, two things. I mean, I think it has nothing to do with Ukraine, uh, I believe. I think it has, people have seen the Quad rise in the last two years. 
uh, that how quickly Biden uh, doubled down on the Quad, uh, how quickly they elevated this process to a summit level, and how quickly uh, that it has is, is gained momentum. Uh, so if the Quad is going to be around and India uh, will be seen as a, as a preferred partner for US and its allies, uh, I suspect that is beginning to change the perceptions because this is an elite poll, this is not a mass poll, uh, that the sense that look, the region is in a is in a reshape. The security architecture is being reshaped, uh, in which India will have a larger role, uh, and probably that's the reason why uh, there is a more positive uh, perception. But I would I would like to hear from you as well. I mean, uh, what you think uh, is uh, is giving us this big bump in uh, in your poll? Yeah, um, uh, I'll invite the ambassador to to give her comments. But I think uh, India is an excellent case. In fact, I have a colleague. Uh, who's writing about her uh, interpretation of the India results from the survey. And one of the points that she's, uh, Joanne is making is that India has scored well on this so-called uh, moving from non-alignment to multi-alignment, you know, in, in, in the sense that it it's, uh, has a multi-directional alignment, be it with the US or the Quad or even China and Russia. And I'm afraid that somehow this speaks quite deeply to the ASEAN DNA, right? Which is like, we, we are not part of any kind of block. We want to be able to work with, you know, any block as long as it's for the interests of Southeast Asia. And I think that perhaps uh, India's kind of momentum on multi-alignment has kind of, you know, uh, uh, seen some fans in, in Southeast Asia, especially in the past year, whether that, has come from Ukraine or not, I, I, I'm not sure. But uh, definitely the, the, the findings do not lie. And uh, I, I think uh, we, there's certainly grounds for further examination. On I it. would just add uh, maybe, because I think last two years, you've seen India pick up its economic momentum again. I, mean, I think the previous few years were not great for India. Uh, India's uh, renewed economic growth, uh, I think probably, and also the the kind of things we've seen, uh, Singapore Airlines investing in Air India. Yeah. So I think you're beginning to see uh, the the greater uh, you know possibilities in a, in a growing uh, Indian economy. So yeah. my sense is probably that too played a played a role. And India is also part of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework that's being led by the United mm -hmm. States. So you know it's kind of showing that beyond RCEP and India has other cards to play as well. Ambassador, do you have any points to add about? Um, India in the in the grander scheme of, of things in the region. I totally agree. We should look at the position of China and the position of India um, through the lens of pragmatism. Uh, naturally, these are two different pairs of shoes. Uh, if you speak about China, by the way, uh, China, the matters of territorial integrity and sovereignty are sacred. It was China that in 2014 supported the UNGA resolution, territorial integrity of Ukraine. When Russia occupied Crimea, China supported Ukraine. Um, China is also the biggest trade partner for my country. Uh, in 2021, our trade turnover was around more than 19 billion US dollars. Um, definitely, China has a bigger turnover with Russia uh, and can get uh, cheap energy from um, the Russian Federation. However, um, the European Union as a trade partner is much more important for China than Russia. Russia is in fact a small economy. It's a country of 140 million people, the largest by territory country in the world, but its economy is smaller than that of the Netherlands and that of South Korea. So that means that it's not a big deal and not a really a big player if it comes to, to such prospects of cooperation. And hence, I do not think for China it's uh, quite a um, uh, thrilling fact uh, the fuel in conflict in the very heart of it. For India, we will see, and now it is an opportunity for India to adopt its mm. leadership role within the G20. And um, I hope that uh, we will see also India's contribution to finding the ways how to secure a robust uh, and uh, stable peace in the uh, uh, central part of Europe. In the Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a great discussion. I wish we had more time, uh, Raja and Katerina, but uh, we've, we've been through so, you know, so many topics about uh, ordinary citizens bearing arms to ASEAN, to 
Ukraine, India, China. I wish we had a lot more time, but I, I'm I before we end, I just want to give thirty seconds uh to Raja and Katarina as to how they see um uh, the second year of the invasion going, and you know for posterity, and then when we check back again, we uh, a year later we'll see you know how prescient <laughs> you you were. Uh, so perhaps uh, Katarina will, will will go forth and you know and give your assessment of what we can see in 30 seconds, uh, uh, what you see in your country in, in, a, in a year coming forward. Thank you. I truly believe that the second year will be the last one and the victorious one for Ukraine and for the whole um, the community of uh, um, like-minded nations, the free world. Um, it will not be the easiest year for us, definitely. We understand and we have got real to uh, keep fighting for independence and our sovereignty. I would just maybe uh, mention one thing about the proper wording, which is very important for um, us Ukrainians, that it's really important to say not just Ukraine war, Ukraine crisis or in Ukraine, but war against Ukraine, because okay. it is kind of black and white when one country attacked another one yeah. in, a, in a brutal way, killing thousands of people, destroying yeah. thousands of infrastructure facilities. 500 children have already died yeah. in, the, in the artillery shellings and bombings. So we need to get all the necessary support and Ukraine will be the world will be. Thanks for that. That's a great qualification to make ambassador. Um, Raja, 30 seconds. Yeah, I think war has always been a, a, a major uh, trigger for change in the structural change in the international system because all great wars uh, have produced structural changes uh, in the international system. And my sense is the this war in Ukraine uh, is also going to uh, produce big changes. Uh, I think Asia has to wake up to uh, rethinking its assumptions about the nature of great power relations, about the nature of globalization, uh, and the role of uh, the various regions here. I mean, because we got too comfortable with our, you know, our premises about the permanence of globalization and the peace between major powers, uh, I think we need to go to go back to the drawing board to rethink our assumptions because uh, the consequences of this war are going to be profound and deeply structural. Thanks for that, Raja. That's the best way, uh, putting in 30 seconds of getting Southeast Asian and Asians to wake up to the new geopolitical landscape that they, they are now part of. So thanks for that. Thanks. Now I want to thank again uh, Ambassador Zelenko and Professor Mohan for for speaking on, on Fulcrum. Really enjoyed your comments and I hope to see you again. Thank you for having us in here. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon.